in the letters of Blake, there is one where he wrote to the Reverend Trussler, the Reverend Dr. Trussler, who had criticized him for his work and said to Blake that you need someone to elucidate your work. So Blake wrote him and said, you ought to know that what can be made explicit to the idiot isn't worth my care. And the wisest of the ancients consider what was not too explicit, the fittest for instruction, because it rouses the faculties to act. Then he went on to say to this reverend, why is the Bible more instructive and entertaining than any book in the world? Is it not because it is addressed to the imagination, which is spiritual sensation, and only but immediately to the understanding or reason? Of course, the reverend did not understand that. Like all the teachers of the world, religious teachers, they treat it as secular history. And Blake knew from his own experience it was not. It was God's plan of salvation. Man must experience history rather than scripture for himself before he can begin to understand how altogether wonderful it is. It's altogether true, but not on this level. Eternity is actually within your immortal head. And that's where the entire drama unfolds. Now let us turn to this book that they call the greatest book in the world. And I will endorse that. I haven't read all the books, but I do not know of anything that could come near the Bible in Revelation. It has nothing to do with science. It's not teaching us anything about the stars, about anything in politics. It's all about God's plan of salvation. Where we turn now to the very first book of the New Testament, Matthew. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Where it establishes the three important characters of Scripture. Now we go back to Genesis and start with the first one now, Abraham. And the Lord tempted Abraham. One translated tested, which may be a better way. And the Lord tested Abraham and said to him, Take your son, your only son Isaac, and offer him as a burnt offering. Abraham took his son the very next day with the fire and the wood and the knife and two young men and went up to Mount Moriah. If you're familiar with the story, you need not tell you the entire thing, but that is the story. The Lord intervened. Abraham, having met the test, he said to him, do not lay your hand upon the lad, for you have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And then he made him the father of the multitude, for the name Abraham means father of multitude. And said to him, they will be more numerous than the stars, more numerous than the sand of the beast. So just estimate that number beyond the wildest dream of man. That will be his offspring, yet he only had one son. Now we know that's a lie right away, if you take it historically. Because twelve years before the birth of Isaac, the Lord gave him a son, whose name was Ishmael, born of a slave in the household of his wife Sarah. For she was barren and was beyond well, bed. It had ceased to be with her after the affairs of women, after the nature of woman. 
And so, finding herself barren and wanting a son and an heir, she sent her servant, Hagar, into her husband, Abraham, that he may know her, which, as story is told, he did, and she bore him a son, and the Lord said, call him Ishmael, which means, God hears, or God has heard. That twelve years prior to the birth of Isaac, yet we are told, Isaac, and these are the words of the Lord, take your son, your only son, and offer him as a burnt offering. How can the one who gave him a son, called Ishmael, now call this one his only son? The word translated son and only son appears only twelve times in the Bible. For the word one is Ahad, but this is translated and defined as one, the only one, the unique one, my darling, my chosen one. Any term of endearment, these are the definitions given to the word that is now translated your son, your only son. Now here, we turn now to the 22nd Psalm, which you find quoted all through the New Testament. It's the Psalm of David. It begins, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is the cry on the cross. Yet the words are the words of David. We find the first verse, the eighth verse, the eighteenth verse, all through the New Testament. And all these are the words of David. We find the same correspondence between the sufferings of Christ and the sufferings of David. The identical words are used and are all now in the words of David. Now in the 22nd Psalm, David sings out to his father the cry of despair. And he said, defend me or deliver me from the sword. Deliver my soul from the sword and my life from the power of the dog. Why my life? That's the same word translated your son, your only son. So why do they now translate it my life? The Hebrew word is Yahweh. And it means your son, your only son. What David is saying, deliver your son, your only son, from the power of the dog. In the second psalm, David has already declared that the Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Now he calls upon the Lord who seemingly has abandoned him. When he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now deliver, not my life, deliver your son, your only son, from the power of the dog. Now we come into the new and we find that all the things said of David are now said of Jesus Christ. What is the secret? Imagine this with me. Can you imagine a command that is absolute? A thing to be done absolutely and continuously. Something stated in the imperative passive mood. Like this. Thy will must be being done. Thy kingdom must be being restored. It's the imperative passive mood. Think of the simple occurrence of an action without reference to completeness or incompleteness. Without reference to duration or repetition. Without reference specifically to its position in time. But sometimes with reference to past time. Just imagine such an action taking place forever and forever, and there is no limit as to its duration. No one knows when the father will stop the action. When God will set the command in force, will stop it. So we do not know the measure of the time. He has no reference to its position in time. 
whether it's the first year B.C., first year A.D., or the year 17, or rather 1971. We do not know. There's no reference to position in time. So think of such an action. Now, you and I have to react, or rather re-enact, this eternal command. You and I will have the experience recorded in that 22nd chapter of Psalm. When suddenly, we are going to experience it now in the real way, for these are all adumbrations. The entire Old Testament is an adumbration. That is a foreshadowing in a not altogether conclusive or immediately evident way. It's a sketchy representation, omitting details, omitting all the little things that you could add into it and put into it and see the picture. It's a very, very sketchy picture. Now, we come into the story of David and takes on more form now. Say unto my servant David, when you lie down with your father, which is a euphemism for death, when you die and you speak with your father, I will raise up your son after you, who shall come forth from your body. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Now that adumbration is taking on more fleshly state now, coming down to the story of Jesus Christ, who is coming out of David. Well, now, who is David? David is the symbol of humanity. Abraham is the symbol of the father of eternity. The father of the multitude, who could it be other than God? So here we have Abraham, the symbol of the father, David, the symbol of humanity, and at the end of the journey, something comes out of humanity, which is the Son of God, that is God. So in the New Testament, the Son is made to say, I and my Father are one. He who sees me has seen the Father. Yet, the Father is greater than I. He is telling us that I am not inferior to my essential being, the Father, only in my present capacity or office as the saint, called the Son, am I inferior, but not as to my essential being, the Father. When I am sent, it's the Father who sent. The Father sent me, but he had no one else to send but himself, so he sent me. In the capacity, in the office of the saint, I seem inferior to myself, the sender. But the sender and the saint are one. That's what we're told in Scripture. He who sees me sees him who sent him. So if you knew my father, you'd know me. And if you knew me, you'd know my father, for we are one. I and my father are one. So here we find Abraham, only the symbol of God the Father, David the symbol of humanity, and Jesus Christ the symbol of the Son of God, which is one with God, for I and my Father are one. So out of humanity, and God plays all the parts, may I tell you, so there's the one part in the world that God isn't playing. And having played all the parts, he extracts from the experiences of humanity that which represents now a son. And that son is called David. For David is the symbol of humanity. Do you understand what Blake meant when he said it's the most entertaining book in the world? And not one book in the world comp compares to it? It's the most instructive book and the most entertaining book. It's like Quicksilver. You're just about to grasp the son and he turns into the father. You're about to grasp the feeling of the father and he turns into the son. Just like Quicksilver. He simply loses himself and eludes your grasp in his many metamorphoses. Suddenly he is not the father, he is the son. 
So now I say to you, say to you at the very end of the story, as the Father sent me, so send I you. He's playing the part now of the Father. He is no longer now the Son. He has departed the world and has returned to himself the Father. I will leave the world and go unto the Father. I came out from the Father and came into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. So I return to myself who sets himself as me. So he comes into the world as the Son. And while he's in the world as the Son, having the experiences of humanity, he seems inferior to himself, the Father. And he is. For he took upon himself the restrictions and the limitations of humanity. Now we are told when he went towards the cross, he carried his own wooden cross on his back. Now, Abraham placed upon Isaac the wood upon his back. Isaac wondered where is the lamb for the sacrifice. For he sees now the wood and he's carried it on his back. The father has the knife to slay and he has the fire to burn that wood. He's going to burn. The burning is the experiences of man. Don't think you haven't been burned. I don't mean in flames. Experiences are the burning that you have in this world. It's from innocence through experience back to God the Father as an awakened imagination. That's the whole story. So here, the Father said to him, God himself will supply the Lamb. He is the Lamb, the symbol of the Lamb. Now let's go back now to the 22nd chapter of the book of Psalms. Remember what he told you in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis. He took two young men and he took the lad, his son, his only son. Hear now the cry of David. Deliver me, your son, your only son, from the power of the dog. Now, you read that and you wonder, what on earth are they talking about? Well, I have many Bibles at home. I haven't found one Bible that comes near the screen because they're writing and speculating. They're theorizing. They have not had the experience. But the day that you meet David, who reveals you as God the Father, is what the most exciting moment in eternity. And there are two young men. And they stand, you are in spirit, but you are all wise at that moment. David is obvious, the most beautiful lad you could put your eyes on. A lad in his teens, early teens. Beautiful beyond description. He symbolizes humanity. You have passed through all that man could ever put upon you. You have borne the father of the allotted time. And now they're going to restore your long lost rank. You were God before you came down, and you're going to be God by going back. But you will be enhanced by reason of the experience of becoming man. So you're looking at David. And here to your right are the two young men. The Bible, for reasons which might be obvious, they're spoken of as dogs. Look up the word dog in the concordance, the biblical concordance, and you will see it means a male harlot. Homosexuals in the service of the priest in the temple. That's who they were. But this story was before that the world was. It didn't develop. They were part of God's plan in the beginning of time. So here they are. You do not hurt them. You are the father now, the father of David who symbolizes humanity. You're looking at this beautiful creature, and they are looking at him too. You're looking at him as a father to a son, eating him for his joy, his beauty, all that he means to you, his love, he is your darling, as the word also means my darling. But they're looking at him concupiscently. They're looking at him in the most lustful manner, and you warn them of his victory, and he's never because the Lord was with him. The day the Lord anointed him, 
the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily from that day forward and never left David. So David never lost a battle. And here is the head of the giant before him. This enormous head severed from the body as David severed the head from the body. And there it is on a table right before you. And here are these two. And you do not a thing about it. It's part of the play. This play has been taking place before that the world was. And no one knows when it's going to come to an end. I can conceive of it coming to an end until every one of us experiences the play and becomes the father of David. For simply God returning to himself. That's the story. God came out from himself into the world, penetrated these bodies, annexed these brains of ours, and made them a portion of himself, a temporary portion. So while he wears the body, the body is a part of the soul, of the one who wears it. He will take it off, just drop it, it means nothing. But while he wears it in this world, it is a part of the soul of the one who wears it. So here, the garment is not the man. The garment is simply just what it is. It's a garment worn of flesh and blood, worn while he's in the world of experience of man. But I tell you from experience, you won't have to wait a second when you take off that garment to see what it really is as against what you thought it was. And when they are crying and weeping because you took it off, you can't believe that they could be so silly, but you were equally silly before you took it off. But nevertheless, you see it. Before I came out tonight, this university student from UCLA sit with my wife while I come to the lecture, because she needs someone to answer the phone and to be present. And before my friend arrived to bring me here, he got talking about these things, these matters. He's from Cairo. He's an Egyptian. And he said to me, you know, my father had this dream. He dreamt that a friend of his was walking down the street with him. And as they were walking down the street, the friend fell. And there he died. He was dead. And many of the people came around and they began to cry and to weep. And they were all looking at him and weeping. A week later, he dropped dead. And the identical thing my father saw, he saw, actually saw him saying to my father, what are they crying about? And here was the garment, they're crying over the garment that he's taken off. I have seen it time and time again. So I cannot be disturbed when a man takes off his garment. Yes, you miss the contact, the little physical contact. But the being who wore it is now clothed again in a garment just like it, but young altogether young and healthy. Whatever was missing before is not missing now. He's returned and restored to a healthy youth. Not a baby, young. I would say about 20. If he died at 100, he's now 20. And he goes through the same world of men, the same terrestrial world, to have the experiences that he must have in order to confront David. These are the three characters. Each are a symbol. Abraham, the symbol of God the Father, David, the symbol of humanity, and Jesus Christ, the symbol of God the Father, having gone through the experiences, because David now, in the spirit, calls him Father. What think ye of the Christ? Yes. And they said, the son of David. He said, well, how then, in the spirit, did David call him my Lord? If David calls him my Lord, how can he be David's son? So he's telling you that David belongs here. It's the sum total of all the experiences of humanity. And it's a beautiful experience when the whole thing is over. Here it seems it's a horrible thing. But when it's all over, the result is transcendent. But that which comes out as the one who was sent to have the experience, because the Father sent himself as the Son. And Jesus Christ is the one having the experience. It is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. Were he not in you, you couldn't have the experience of being man. And so he suffered. And you call it, but you are suffering. But as Blake said it so beautifully. 
Babel mock, saying there is no God, no Son of God, that God, O human imagination, O divine body, are all a delusion. But I know thee, O Lord, when thou arisest upon my weary eyes, even in this dungeon and this iron mill, thou also suffer to me, although I behold thee not. Can't behold the being that is having experience, as you do objects in space, because the being having experience is that which is called imagination. You can't behold imagination. Imagination is the reality that is called this thing called God. So the voice answered, and it's your own wonderful human imagination answering. Fear not. I am with you all, only believe in me that I have power to raise from the dead your brother who sleeps in this world called Alton. Everyone will rise. Not one can stop. They couldn't even stop it if they wanted to. There is no such thing as complete annihilation. There is no annihilation. You gave it up in the beginning to come here. And when you came here, you completely forgot. Total amnesia. You forgot who you were. Listen to the word. Return unto me the glory that was mine. The glory that I had with thee before that the world was. This is not new. You gave up the fatherhood. And yourself came into the world as the son. The one that is sent. The one that is now to be made a burnt offering. And you are the burnt offering in this world. And you pass through hell in this world. But you are still one with the Father. I and my Father are one. Even though my Father is greater than I. For I will return to myself the Father. Having experienced what I came out to experience. And I as Father will be enhanced by the experience of being man. Everyone is going to happen. Not one will fail. So today, if I really see it clearly, you'll see this peculiar mystery in the Bible. The whole vast world is yourself pushed out, and all these characters are simply states of consciousness into which you can, in one, one little moment, vanish. You try to grasp them, and all of a sudden you vanish into that one, into that one. You can't quite put your hand upon it. But you do in the depths of your being. And you bring back glimpses of it. And then you share it with your brothers. Because in the end, we are all one. And yet without loss of identity, we will be God the Father. The Father of David. And I know I am God the Father, the Father of David. And yet we are the same Father. We have the same Son. And yet we have no loss of identity. That is something that is difficult to explain. So this comes to us, this mystery called Christ. He comes to us as one unknown. Not from the outside. He is on the inside. He rises in us as one unknown. In the most strange, wonderful, ineffable mystery. Yet he is that one who lets us experience who he is. You don't see him, you experience being him. Because he was called father by David. And David is going to call you father. And may I tell you when he does, it's not a shock. It's only the returning of memory. You know that you have always been that. That was taking place in the beginning of time. But no one could attain to that bliss except he was generated on earth. So man had to come down, that is, God had to come down and be generated on earth and reenact the drama that is eternal. For that drama was simply 
an adumbration. It was a sketchy representation, omitting all the details. We come down here and we go to the furnaces. And having these furnaces here on earth, while we walk as man, it becomes a cubic reality. And now we know the meaning of these sketches that we read in the Bible. You see now what the two young men were that Abraham took with it up to Mount Moriah. He took two young men and he took his son. Well, here was my son and he wasn't called Isaac. He was called David. And here were two young men. It's not described what they were in the Bible. I know what they are. I know there are men who look concupiscently at my darling, at my son. And I simply warn them of this fact. I warn them of what took place because he won the battle against the giant. And he who wins that battle against the giant who would destroy Israel sets his own father free. For the promise is the man who brings down the enemy of Israel, I will set his father free. So here is the giant's head severed from the body. And who is the father of the one who brought him down? Well, I am. But what's the father's name in the Bible? The father's name is Jesse. You know what the word Jesse means? Jehovah exists. That's what it means. It is any form of the verb to be. In other words, the one who bears the name I am. But its true definition is Jehovah exists. And here the father is looking at his son. Now you know who you are. So when Blake said in a very cryptic manner, after the death of Christ, he became Jehovah. He returned to himself, Jehovah. In the end, there is nothing but the Lord God, Jehovah. There is nothing but God. So he sends himself into the world, and the thing sent is the Son. He comes bearing witness of his Father. And we speak of him in the Bible as Jesus, the Lord, or Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. But the only Savior in the Bible is Jehovah himself. As told us in the 43rd and the 45th chapters of the book of Isaiah. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And besides me there is no Savior. So if he comes as Savior, he is Jehovah. And so when he departs, he returns to himself, the Lord God Jehovah. There is nothing but God in the world. In spite of all the horror, but this is the flame spoken of in Scripture. These are the burns. Father, I see the knife. I see the wood. I'm carrying the wood. I see the flame. But where is the lamb? See the imagery of the lamb, the symbol of the lamb? And in the end, the Father himself really played the part. But in playing the part, he appeared as the Son. Because it is only God the Father. So everyone is going to have the experience of Scripture. And I can't tell anyone what a thrill it is when it begins to unfold within you. It comes so suddenly, without warning, and suddenly, all within your head. That's why I started off by telling you eternity dwells within your immortal head. That is an immortal head, and all the whole play is taking place there. But in the fullness of time, you experience it. It is taking place. It is a command that must be done absolutely and continuously, without reference to position in time, without any reference as to its completeness or incompleteness. But it is not completed until man on earth replays the drama. And he does it when he replays it within himself, it takes on the cubic reality. While as it's told through the medium of the prophets, it is a sketchy representation, omitting all the details. That's why the, the one who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews could say that in many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. 
But in these last days, he is spoken to us by a son. There is no further revelation than when the son appears. For then, you know who you are. And what man is seeking in this world is the father. Everyone is seeking the father, the cause of the phenomena of life. There is only one cause. And blessed is the man who is freed from the tyranny of second causes. So there is only one cause, and that is God the Father. So as God the Father tempted, Abraham is tempting himself, for he's only the symbol of himself. Can I really go through hell and return? Can I die and rise? And God took the challenge, people can die and rise. But in rising, he enhanced the brilliance of himself the greatness of himself, because there is no limit to extension, no limit to his wonderful transcendency. He placed a limit upon opacity and upon contraction, and that limit is man. So when he became man and he could not play that he is man, he isn't pretending that he is man, he is man, he becomes man. Even though it's a princely garment that he wears, while he wears it, he is so identified with it, he feels that it's myself. You cut him and he hurts. He chop off a finger and he said, I have lost my finger. He is so much a part of the garment that he wears that he can't separate himself from it, seemingly. But the day will come, he will simply take it off and return to himself, but he will be enhanced by reason of the experience in this journey as man. But when the day comes for the individual, no one knows. Of that hour, of that day, only the Father knows. No one knows what the Father. Let no one tell you that can tell you when it's going to happen. I know from my own experience it comes so suddenly. Little did I expect the night I went to bed in San Francisco, that that night, on July the 20th, 1959, was it the night. On the 6th day of December that same year did I know that night that that fatherhood of God would be revealed to me by his son who would call me father. Little did I know of the ascent into heaven on the morning of the 8th of April of the following year, 1960. And on January the 1st, 1963, when the dove descended in bodily form and smother me with kisses. It was the descent of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. Therefore, that was the climax of it all. That was putting the seal of approval on the journey. And you simply now delay your departure to tell and encourage those who are ready to hear it. And so those who are ready to hear it are hearing it. And you can then spread the word and tell it. You will tell it first as hearsay, but eventually you will tell it from experience. For the evangelists, in writing the story in our Gospels, they're simply relating their own experience. They were not telling it from hearsay. They told exactly what happened to them. But they told it for reasons known to them in the third person. So they spoke of him constantly. But they're really telling their own experience. But no one in my spirit world has curtailed my calm. So I was not commanded to tell it in the third person. I was simply told to tell it. And so I tell it as I must tell it in the first person. For I am telling and relating my own experience. Everything spoken of in scripture concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, I have experienced. But I am limited while I wear this garment. With all the weaknesses of the garment, I have assumed it. All the limitations of the garment of flesh and blood, I have assumed it. And I must continue to assume it until that moment in time when I take it off, and take it off for the last time. Yet I am one with those who have not yet taken it off, because there is only one father. And so I cannot crow. I cannot raise my voice and simply yell that I did it. Although the 22nd Psalm does aim on a note of that nature, posterity will sing his praises 
And they will all say the Lord has wrought it. All the things are horrors of that 22nd Psalm, beginning with the cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And all the pleas that he makes to be delivered from all the things run the loving. But in the end, the Lord wrought it. An unborn tomorrow will hear that it was done, it was accomplished. And that will encourage them to go on to the furnaces of affliction. But how long, how vast, how severe these furnaces, before man actually discovers himself as God the Father, will long to tell. But he will discover it, and he will know he is God the Father, and there is only God. In the meanwhile, you take what I've told you so far concerning the law, and apply it. Apply the law. Your dreams, my, may I tell you, are most encouraging. Most encouraging. And who saw a husband encased in all kinds of well, limitations from the hips down. And before her eyes, they all began to crack and break and fall apart. And then he jumped and danced for joy. So, take it just as you saw it. He is released. He's been freed from the restrictions, whatever they were, in the immediate present. Completely free. And many of you have these wonderful experiences. Another one who sits next to her tonight, he has a dream of a wedding. And I was the only one, seemingly, that they would discuss. I sat to her right at a very long table, but across the table. And they all wondered why Neville is here, because this was a Jewish wedding. And yet she knew that I was going to give the main speech of the evening. And why is he here? And so I spoke in my own tongue, but each man heard me in his own tongue wherein he was born. And those who thought, because they were all Jewish, that they would not accept me, all but one accepted me. The one who was controversial in the beginning, he didn't understand one word that I said, but all the others that he thought would not accept me. But I thought that was the most marvelous vision that he had. And many of them, one after the other. One has had one, I'll tell her now from the platform. That she and her husband, in her dream, she saw a snake, a rattlesnake. And the husband said, I must take off the rattlers first. So he began to take off the rattlers. And she handed him a hammer to beat it. And to beat the snake to kill it. And in beating it, she woke. Now that is a different kind of a dream. That's a symbol of sex. You cannot crush out sex on this level. It has to be something that is entirely different. You don't crush it out. You start to crush it out and strange peculiar dreams will possess you. It has to be transcended in the most normal, natural manner. It's not really transcended until you ascend into heaven. That comes when your body is fit from top to bottom, and you, like a fiery serpent, ascend into heaven. And you see that golden liquid light at the base of your spine, after your body is severed in two from top to bottom, and you see that pool of golden living liquid light. And you fuse with it, and you become it, and like a fiery serpent, up you go, into heaven, and you take it by force. You take it violently. Now the energies that went down into generation are now reversed and up into regeneration. But while they are still down, and you try to kill it, as many people do, are the early church members of the Catholic Church. His name was Oregon. He had himself frustrated but he would not be tempted by the women that he was teaching. He was one of the true early fathers of the church. He was born, or rather he died 100 years before Augustine was born. That's how early he was. He came in the second century A.D. And he was one of the moving spirits in the formation of the early church known as the Catholic Church. 
and will read the story in the Encyclopedia Britannica. His name is Oregon. And he frustrated himself that he may not be disturbed when he had to face women and teach them the mystery of Christ. But he still could not cut it out that way. You can castrate the man or woman, but it will still be in his imagination. And his dreams will be still be of that nature. So you cannot hit it and kill it. It is simply something that leaves you by a reversal of energy. It turns from generations into...